Hyde Park, New York, where in 1882, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born. Following a political career in his native state, Roosevelt became Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1913. In 1920, he campaigned unsuccessfully for vice presidency. Warm Springs, Georgia, proved a haven of health when illness interrupted the ascendancy of his political career. When the country appeared to be in a whirl of glowing prosperity, he was urged by Democratic Party leaders to become a candidate for governor of New York. 1928 saw him succeeding Governor Alfred E. Smith at Albany. Governor Roosevelt served two terms as chief executive of the Empire State. Liberal measures marked his administration. Governor Roosevelt became the choice of the Democratic Convention in 1932. The spectacular flight to Chicago marked the beginning of his rise to the presidency. The Forgotten Man and the New Deal became his campaign slogans. President Hoover was the symbol of national business and personal depression as the backwash of post-war economic conditions engulfed America. Factories were idle. The unemployed marched upon Washington. The nation demanded a change, and Roosevelt was swept into the presidency. Defeated President Herbert Hoover was the last president to retire from the White House in the month of March. Likewise, Mr. Roosevelt was the last to take the oath of office as chief executive on the traditional March 4th date. The new president's first inaugural address called for a mammoth program of social legislation, reduction of national expenditures, and if necessary, emergency powers to bring about recovery. Almost immediately upon taking office, the new president closed all banks by proclamation. The financial world was frozen. A new force held the reins. The nation rallied to the NRA as a motivating force for recovery. Aimed at benefiting the farmer by reducing wheat, corn, and cotton crops, the AAA was enacted. The nation was plagued with labor dissensions, textile strikes, waterfront workers' disputes, and for the first time, sit-down strikes in the automotive industry. WPA, PWA, and CCC camps aided millions of the nation's unemployed. Supported by his New Deal advisors, the president vigorously sponsored job insurance, old age pensions, social security, and other general social measures. Governor Landon opposed President Roosevelt in the campaign of 1936, a weak opposition which failed. Chairman Farley's great organizing talent gave Roosevelt and Garner all but two of the 48 states. In the fall of 1936, the president visited South America to personally advocate his good neighbor policy as unrest spread abroad. Nineteen thirty-seven, President Roosevelt became the first chief executive to be sworn in on the new inaugural day, January 20th. Severe weather and pouring rains dampened the scene of his second inauguration, but not his bristling address to the nation. With war spreading in Europe and Asia, President Roosevelt at Kingston, Ontario, solemnly pledged that the United States would fight to protect Canada if that country were ever invaded. The devastating march of war over old world democracies directed President Roosevelt's attention closely to international problems. Aid short of war was asked, embargoes lifted, naval aid was given to Great Britain. In 1940, Wendell Wilkie opposed the president who became our first consecutive third term candidate. Mr. Wilkie won 22 million votes, but the president was re-elected by 27 million. The first third term candidate, Mr. Roosevelt confined his campaign activities largely to defense inspection trips. January 20th, 1941. The start of a journey never before made in American history. 
that of a president-elect to his third consecutive inauguration. Pennsylvania Avenue is thronged with cheering multitudes to whom the president genuinely waves in response to their enthusiasm. A great, a solemn event in the life of this nation, the swearing-in of the citizen whom the people have chosen to guide, serve, and protect the entire country for the next four years. On toward America's symbol of freedom, Vice President Garner passes from the national scene when he swears in Henry Wallace, his successor. As in previous inaugurations, Chief Justice Hughes administers the sacred oath. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Thus the anti-third term tradition passes from American life, as President Roosevelt accepts with confidence and grace the honor which George Washington refused. In this day, the task of the people is to save that nation and its institutions from disruption from without in the face of great perils never before encountered. Our strong purpose is to protect and to perpetuate the integrity of democracy. For this, for this we must die the spirit of America and the faith of America. We do not retreat. We are not content to stand still. As Americans, we go forward in the service of our country by the will of God. Scarcely is the president's address finished than the stirring spectacle of the inaugural parade begins. Reviewing troops at the Court of Freedom. A military parade of which the defense program is the keynote. The West Point Cadets. Ahead, Four grim, uncertain years. For President Roosevelt, the colossal task of arming and protecting this nation without sacrificing its democratic heritage. And aiding with airplanes, ships, and guns, other democracies now struggling to banish oppression and safeguard the rights of free men throughout the world. Grim units of the regular army demonstrate to the nation and to the world that America's defense has begun.